Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 1067. 1067, Monday, March the 9th, 2020. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, so let's go ahead and get to the news of the day and then we'll get on to the dumbass of the week. Get my notes organized here. There we go. Kind of out of order. Alrighty. Okay, so it looks like that the uh, DNC and CNN, the Commie News Network, have gotten together to change the debate format uh, for the next debate. So it was going to be just like a typical debate. They stand at podiums and they're asked questions by the so-called professional moderators. But now it appears that they've changed the format. So the next debate between uh, Commie Bernie and uh, Barisma Joe is going to be a sit-down town hall style meeting with people in the audience asking the questions. Now, uh, obviously we know why they're doing this. They're doing it uh, like they're doing everything else to try to protect uh, Burisma Joe as much as they can. Oh, Biden. Yes, they're trying to protect Oh, Biden. <laughs> because uh, when they're sitting down, obviously it's less taxing than standing up. And uh, although the Sanders campaign has come out and said they have no problem with the original format, standing up is fine with Bernie. But, uh, of course, this is being done to help uh, Burisma Joe. So maybe they think sitting down, he'll do better. I don't really think it matters if he's sitting down or standing up. Uh, the problem is not in his legs. It's uh, what's going on between his ears. The fact that he doesn't know where he is in his own mind and uh, loses track of his own thoughts while he's thinking them. That would be the major problem. Um, now, the debate rules with letting audience members ask the questions mean you won't have to worry about follow-up questions. It's generally a lot less pressure because the questions aren't pointed and and you don't get the follow up. Uh, these are just normally like these softball open ended questions, which gives a candidate the ability to try to where you can just sit there and uh, basically filibuster for two minutes and say practically nothing. So that is probably an advantage for Biden. But I think that Bernie again is so focused on issue uh, issue type uh, debates that Bernie will try to. Uh, force Biden to debate issues. And that's a tough position for Biden to be in because when you look at it, quite honestly, there's not that big of a difference policy-wise between uh, Biden and Bernie because Biden has been forced to move so far to the left. So, uh, you know, but they both have a lot of problems. Um, but yeah, this shouldn't uh, surprise us. I expect that there'll be uh, more of this type of thing because, you know, as I was watching uh, over the weekend, had a little bit of time to watch some of the left-wing outlets. And you can clearly see when you watch the establishment media, you know, the MSNBC, CNN, and all the rest, uh, they will not even talk about Joe Biden's mental issues. They just refer to his gaffes. What we're seeing with Biden are not gaffes. He's always made gaffes. These are not gaffes. These are actually problems with him with some brain function that, that's not really what it should be. And they know that. They're, they, they know this very well. Um, but it's kind of funny. You watch the mainstream media outlets, and uh, they're in total protection mode uh, for Biden. Uh, but you watch the independent media, such as, uh, you know, Tim Pool or Young Turks or uh, any of the, of the people on the left, uh, even The Hill, uh, Crystal Ball, who's a Bernie supporter on The, on the Hill. Um, they are you know, obviously making a huge uh, deal about Biden's mental failings. And so uh, you do see this sort of uh, battle going on between the independent left-wing media and the establishment left-wing media. They are totally at odds uh, uh, over how they're handling uh, Biden's uh, issue with his mental faculties uh, fading uh, at his old age. So we'll continue to watch this dynamic as it plays itself out. And ultimately, uh, it is going to play itself out. The idea that the mainstream media and the independent, independent left-wing media is right here. Uh, they cannot hide Biden's mental uh, failings right now unless they completely take him off of TV, uh, take him out of the spotlight, uh, put him in a, you know, I don't know, just get rid of him, hide him somewhere, and just send his surrogates out to speak on his behalf. As long as he's got a microphone or a camera in front of him, uh, there's a potential there for him to uh, melt down and just completely lose it and uh, have a moment that they, he just can't recover from. And uh, this is obviously what they fear. So we'll continue to watch this, but uh, you know, looking at these next two debates coming up, I mean, obviously Biden has taken about a 60 some odd point lead in delegates. 
the next two Big Tuesday voting days actually favor uh, Biden. Uh, there's a couple states there that uh, Bernie could win that have pretty good delegate counts, Michigan and Washington State being two of them. Um, but right now, I don't know that, uh, that Bernie is winning in either of them places that big. And for Bernie to catch up and then surpass Biden and delegates, he's going to have to win the big states by large majorities, and he's going to have to be competitive in the states where he's going to lose and at least ways get some delegates. That's the only way that he can, can get ahead of Biden and delegates. But you have to say at this point, it looks like it's Biden's race to lose. Now, here's where the trick comes in, is that as long as Biden has got to go out and campaign, perform in debates, give speeches, any time that this guy has got to be in front of a camera or on a microphone in public, uh, he is a potential for having the type of mental uh, breakdown that could literally cost him. I mean, if he, if he has a major brain gaffe in one of these next two debates, that alone could totally throw the whole thing into chaos. I mean, and, and you know it's very likely to happen. Very likely to happen. Biden is one major brain fart away from having this whole thing just get away from him and uh, have the Democrats have to start thinking long and hard about whether or not they can actually get behind him. Now, as you know, I've already stated that I don't think that there's any way that they're going to allow Biden to be the nominee. They need him to stay in the game just long enough to take out Bernie, to make sure that Bernie does not have a clear path to the majority of delegates. As soon as it becomes mathematically impossible for Bernie to catch Biden, then I think you're going to start hearing the the conversation change, and then they'll start talking about, well, Biden seems to be having some issues here, and the next thing you know, they're going to have to say, and this will probably happen, I think, even prior to the convention, maybe a week or two before the convention, uh, they're going to have to admit, yeah, we just don't think that, you know, Biden's mentally capable of doing this, at which point uh, you have the rotten Reverend Clinton, who's waiting in the wings. She's out there literally every day. She's on some TV show, some radio show doing some media event. She is out selling herself as hard as she possibly can because she sees the situation. Uh, she knows that Bernie is uh, a no-go and she can see that Biden is quickly becoming a no-go and she knows that she's the next person in line. So there's no question that this is all being cooked up. I have no doubt that even the people in the Democratic establishment know that, that um, Biden's not going to make it. They just need him to hang out there for a couple more weeks. If they can just hide him and protect him for a couple, two, three more weeks until March 27th, then after that, they can dump him, kick him to the curb, and uh, bring in Hillary. So that's what it looks like to me. We'll keep following as uh, things develop. Interesting, we had uh, Joe Rogan, uh, you know, I don't know if you saw his comment on his podcast there, but he's like, you know, no, that, you know, Biden can't be the nominee. I mean, and, uh, you know, Rogan is, uh, got the largest podcast on the planet, I believe. And what's, what's unique about him is he has people who, who listen to his show who are far left, far right. Uh, so Rogan kind of appeals to everybody. You don't really know where he even stands personally. Uh, he'll make comments one day that I, I could, I could support Bernie. And then the next day, oh, yeah, Trump's doing all right. You know, so you never really know with Rogan. Uh, he just, you know, don't really know. And that's so many people listen to him. But his comments that he made, uh, I think it was Friday, uh, you know, very in a very serious way, wasn't even joking. Uh, he's like, no, you know, Biden can't be the nominee. I mean, this is, this, this can't happen. And uh, I think everyone knows that. The Democratic establishment, Republicans know it. You know it. I know it. Everyone knows it. You can see it. The guy cannot, the guys cannot you know, run for president, okay? So, uh, and they're not going to uh, give it to Bernie. And like I said, there's the rotten Reverend Clinton right there. She's in the media every day, and she's out there selling herself just as hard as she can. Watch and see how this, how this pans out. Well, we have uh, Biden, of course, yesterday calling Trump a boll weevil. Now, a boll weevil is basically a little beetle a little beetle, and I think it primarily uh, feeds on uh, cotton, uh, I believe is how that works. So not really sure why you would call Trump a boll weevil, but okay. 
He's a little nutty. Actually, he's a lot nutty. Yes, and we also have the Rotten Reverend Clinton. She was on CNN, I believe on Sunday morning, uh, on CNN, and she says that, <laughs> she says that, quote, uh, Biden is building the same coalition that I did. <laughs> the same coalition you did? You mean the same coalition that lost? The same coalition that turned three really blue states red? That's the coalition you're talking about? No, I think the coalition you were talking about uh, included a lot more blacks and Latinos. <laughs> Trump only got 7% of those uh, in 2016. He's going to double or triple that in 2020. The Rotten Reverend Clinton, again, as I, as I said, and of course she's also blaming uh, all the women dropping out of the race, and even the reason why she didn't get elected again is being because of misogyny. Misogyny. Yeah, um, so I guess what she and other leftists are saying is that the Democratic Party is full of misogynists. Appears to be what she's saying. Well, we had a couple big endorsements yesterday. We had Kamala Legs in the Air Harris come out and endorse Biden. She endorsed Biden. I don't know how much that'll help. California's already voted. Not that Kamala Harris has that much sway in California because, as we know, she's not very popular there either. She's not really popular anywhere, actually. Uh, she might get popular in the Jesse Smollett case, but uh, she's not popular currently. Uh, and, of course, Jesse Jackson came out and gave his endorsement for Bernie. Uh, I don't think that Jesse Jackson carries much weight anymore. Uh, 25 years ago, that might have been, you know, an endorsement you'd like to have. But I don't think that uh, Bernie, that um, Jesse Jackson has much, uh, you know, even a lot, even most blacks these days know that Jesse Jackson is a snake oil salesman and a con man. Much like Bernie, which is the reason why we probably shouldn't be surprised uh, that he supports Bernie. And he's also a, a socialist, so that uh, that should certainly add up. And he's got a personal dig with Biden anyway, and he always has. So that doesn't surprise me. Now, uh, this past week, I haven't had a chance to get to it yet, but I wanted to follow up on it. There was quite a bit of reading to do on this. Uh, so I wanted to follow up on it before I actually commented on it. But I haven't had a chance to look at this now. And it has to do with some posts that were put up last week by Technofog. Um, so Technofog, looking at these this last group of documents that were dropped, the same ones that Solomon uh, was commenting on and Greg Jarrett was commenting on, there's some stuff in there that's kind of new. Uh, we've already talked about some of it. But what Technofog has uh, closed in on is some conversations in that Strzok, Page, Pre-Step, McCabe group, the small group. Conversations that they were having just about the day before and the day or two after Obama decided to um, kick out all these Russian ambassadors and uh, diplomats and officials. And he is taking that and he's taking a look at the timeline and taking a look at there's some emails uh, between Sally Yates and Mary McCord and Tash Gohar and some of the people over to DOJ and Technofog is making a pretty good argument that the Kislyak, uh, Michael Flynn phone call, the whole thing might have been a total setup. Might have been a setup, not an accident. And he lays out this scenario that if you look at the timeline and then you look at all the corresponding communications in and around all this, it certainly looks like it was a setup. And uh, he points out that uh, you have Obama kicking out Russian diplomats, knowing good and well that that would entice Michael Flynn to contact the Russian ambassador Kislyak um, because it's a fairly major event. Uh, Obama's kicking these Russian ambassadors out during this transition period, and so Michael Flynn, being the incoming national security advisor, probably would call the Russian ambassador and say, yes, well, yeah, obviously Obama just kicked out all these ambassadors, but hey, this is temporary. Once we take over, uh, we're going to reevaluate policy and don't you know, worry too much about this. So it appears that what Technofog is saying, if you look at the corresponding emails and text between the various players at FBI and DOJ, they knew this was coming, and it's the way that they responded to it after it happened. And it also shows that they really weren't all that, you know, uh, in fact, not at all. They weren't the least bit um, concerned about the Flynn-Kislyak phone call. 
the, nothing about the phone call bothered them. In fact, they seem to be expecting it. So what he's laying out here is that, is that Obama actually expelled these Russian diplomats knowing good and well it would prompt Flynn to make that phone call to Kislyak and they would be listening. Then after this happens you get Clapper, we get the email where Clapper of course contacts David Ignatius and that's when he makes that statement take the kill shot on Flynn and of course this is right after the uh, Flynn call is leaked. And there you have Clapper telling David Ignatius to take the kill shot on Flynn. We also learn from looking at this, e at this email chain from the FBI and the DOJ right in the days that this was all happening, uh, we can see that uh, Silly Sally Yates, Mary McCord, uh, Tash Gohar, and Adam Schiff, Schiff were all kept in the loop as all of this was going down. We also know that the original Flynn 302 apparently is nowhere to be found. They can't find it. But we know that Sidney Powell has requested certain documents and seems to have some information that the rest of us don't have that would suggest that she knows that there is an original 302 and that it was edited as well as the second 302 which was also edited and Sidney Powell has reason to believe and there's emails that might be backing this up that suggest that uh, that um, Lisa Page was the one who edited those 302s. She was in fact asked about that in her testimony and said that she did not recall. So there you go. Clearly there's missing pieces and Technofog is trying to put the pieces together and I read through those emails and I looked at the timeline and it certainly does make sense. It certainly does make sense. Keep in mind, when Obama expels these Russian diplomats, everything that had been going on, uh, Obama had first been told about possible Russian meddling in the election months earlier. Did nothing. Never did anything other than supposedly telling Putin to, to, to watch out or, or to back off or what have you. But this move with expelling these diplomats comes during the transition period when really he's not even supposed to be doing something like that. Didn't tell the Trump administration. Didn't advise Michael Flynn. If he was going to do that, he should have been working with the transition team and it should have been their call. Uh, at least they should have been notified. But they didn't notify Michael Flynn. They should have notified Michael Flynn. They should have said, hey, President Obama, we know we're in the transition period, but with all the stuff he's learning about the Russians and the meddling and all that, he thinks it's a good idea to go ahead and, and he's going to go ahead and let the Russians know he's expelling these diplomats. But they never told Flynn that. Kept him in the dark. Never consulted with him or the transition team. They just went ahead and expelled these diplomats, these Russian diplomats. And if you look at the email conversations going on at the DOJ and the FBI, clearly they were expecting something to happen. Then, they ex then Obama expels the diplomats. Then, immediately, there's a lot of activity, a lot of emails going back and forth. Then, the, uh, then you see them discussing the Kislyak call, and they're not the least bit concerned about it. Not the least bit concerned. But then the very next two or three days, a series, a flurry of emails from Silly Sally Yates uh, and Trish Gohauer and, of course, people at the FBI. And the issue seemed to be that they were arguing over is that Sally Yates wanted to pursue um, something having to do with the uh, my, with the Logan Act, and Michael Flynn violating the Logan Act, and with this conversation he had with Kislyak, even though they had no problem with it initially, and the FBI was worried um, that this would interfere or that this would, would be a problem for their investigation, and they also were concerned about beginning an investigation into the incoming National Security Advisor and how that might work. Uh, and uh, so there was a lot of issues surrounding that. But uh, of course, then you have uh, uh, them releasing this phone call, it gets leaked, 
And, of course, then you have the email from Clapper to Ignatius saying, take the kill shot on Flynn. So clearly there was a scheme at, at, at bay. Exactly what, how that all worked out down to the very last detail, we're not sure. But all, all, all that the Technofog lays out here uh, certainly looks like that was a setup. That they, they wanted to do that to force Flynn's hand, knowing good and well that he would call Kislyak to smooth things over after these diplomats were, you know, booted out of the country. So they knew the, they knew the call would, would happen, and they were listening in, and they were ready to move on it. They had everyone in place. As soon as it happens, they're on it like white on rice. <clears throat> no delay whatsoever, and there's a flurry of activity. So clearly, it looks like this was another setup of a Trump administration official. Not just an accident that that call was leaked, and it's very likely that the person who leaked that call was Stefan Halper's boss, who's also named James Baker. <laughs> Got a lot of James Bakers. So uh, anyway, that's where things are right now. Obviously, there is missing pieces uh, that we don't have, but certainly John Durham does. You know, we're probably going to find out uh, in his investigation. Uh, it'll probably be confirmed. He will probably find out who did actually leak that Kislyak phone call. And if he looks at all the things that Technofog is laying out here, and I'm sure he has, then he'll probably put the same uh, pieces together and come to uh, the same conclusion or a very similar conclusion that this was a plot as well. This was just another scheme like all the other schemes. Unbelievable. Alrighty, let's do some dumbass of the week. As you know, my pick for this week was, of course, um, Brian Lion Brian Williams, uh, who, uh, quite honestly, is not very good at math. So let's go through these now. Well, we have Lee. He's going to go with uh, Chuck the Cuck Schumer, Brian Williams, and Joe Biden. Uh, Babs, Babs is going to go with Chuck the Cuck. He he is going to go with Joe, quid pro quo Joe, Barisma Joe Biden. Lori Holt is going to go with uh, Chuck the Schmuck, Brian Williams, and Brain Dead Biden. Impeach My Ass is going to go with Jink Yogurt. Yeah, Jink had a meltdown. Did you guys check out the Jink meltdown? <laughs> Not as good as 2016, but maybe 2020 will be better. But it was still a pretty good meltdown. And that, du that dude's living in a fantasy world. By the way, he came in a distant fourth place in his run for Congress. Papagalopoulos didn't even get on the ballot, I don't think. We'll find out. Uh, uh, cards is going to go with the Penguin, Jerry Nadler. Yeah, we have Jerry Nadler last week. Uh, let's see, he's wanting to go to the appeals court to try to appeal the decision uh, of uh, of uh, Trump's attorney, McGahn, not having to testify. Now the Penguin wants to go to the appeals court. <laughs> and he also is suggesting that he will call the sergeant of arms to have people arrested if they don't come and testify. So he's clearly uh, got advanced TDS. The Penguin. See, the sane environmentalist is going to go with the corporate mainstream media and the disaster that they are, the fake news. Oregon Outback is going to go with um, uh, Brian, the new math, Williams. <laughs> the new math, yeah, that's the new math, all right. Um, let's see, we have Jay Wexler. We'll go with Burisma Joe uh, for his endorsing Trump. Yeah, I mean, we've heard him tell people to go vote for someone else, but he's never specifically said go vote for Trump before. But uh, that's exactly what he did. We've got it on video. We have Gene. Gene is going to go with uh, Chucky the uh, the Clown, uh, Brian Williams, and that reporter uh, who, between the two of them, couldn't figure out the, the simple math. And, of course, the sniffer, Biden. We have It's Angry Bob. It's Angry Bob is going to go with Chuck the Cuck, Barisma Joe, and Brian Williams. Partly Sunny is going to go with um, O'Biden-Bama. <laughs> Oh, Biden, Obama. Yes, that's right. Douglas. That's right. It's Douglas. And here we go. Douglas, anyone on a cruise ship? <laughs> I got to hand it to Douglas, though. Uh, he was warning us about these cruise ships. He's been talking about the cruise ships now for about two months. So you have to hand it to Douglas. He was ahead of the crowd, uh, pointing out that it's not a good place to be on a cruise ship. I agree. Well done, Douglas. He also is going to go with Biden's incestuous sister <laughs> and Lewinsky. Yes, indeed. Jeremy, uh, Jenny tweets, 
is going to go with Brian Williams and Bill Clinton. Yes, Bill Clinton out there lying his ass off again, right along with the Rotten Reverend Clinton. They're trying to repackage and resell themselves for that 2020 run. Susan Lowell uh, is going to go with Crying Chuck. Straight Arrow will go with Schumer and the guy that was standing behind him holding the sign that said protecting abortion access is a Catholic value. <laughs> protecting abortion access is a Catholic value. I don't know. Most traditional Catholics don't even believe in birth control, let alone abortion. Uh, let's see. Michael. Michael, anyone who thinks that Biden will be the nominee. I agree. You are a dumbass if you think that Biden is going to make it uh, to being the nominee. He might not even make it past the second debate. I mean, every second on the clock that ticks off where he's in front of a microphone and a camera, you have to be sweating bullets if you're the Democratic National Committee. Because he is, you know the gaffe is coming. What you don't know is how big and how bad it's going to be. So Michael is absolutely correct. Uh, Michael's also going to go with Brian Williams and Chuck the Cuck. Youngblood will go with Chuck the Cuck. Uh, Zara Drew will go with Upchuck Schumer. Peter James is going to go with Shucky, Brian Williams, and Joe Biden. Metamistic is going to go with Biden and Williams. Jonathan Cassidy will go with Crying Chuck Schumer, Brian Williams, and the Rotten Reverend Clinton. Joe Mack is going to go with both of the Bidens and Lion Bryan. Sherman Lynn will go with Brian Williams and the Democratic National Committee. Monica, I'm sorry, Mona, Mona Lisa will go with Math Boy. <laughs> Math Boy, yes, good old Math Boy Brian Williams. Boy, he's a, he's something else, isn't he? How that guy keeps his job, I do not know. Uh, Mora, the lovely and talented Mora, she is going to go with Brian Williams, Joe Biden, and Mad Cal. Yes, that's right. I don't know how many of you saw the Mad Cal segment uh, where she literally broke into tears after Elizabeth Warren uh, had to bail out because she's she's now uh, I guess uh, feeling horrible because she may never ever get to see a woman. Uh, become president. And, you know, this whole thing about misogyny and way, uh, uh, women not being present, there's a real good reason why no woman has become president yet, because there just hasn't been one who's a good candidate, quite honestly. You've had a couple that may have been okay for a VP, but there hasn't really been a woman yet that I look at that I think I could think, yeah, I, I could vote for her for president. You know, they're, they're weak, and it's not that women are weak per se, but you have to be a, a a very unique type of woman, I think, like a Margaret Thatcher um, type of woman. Elizabeth Warren, uh, Kamala Harris, I mean, th these are people who are a joke. The Rotten Reverend Clinton, uh, Klobuchar, uh, even Carly Fiorina, uh, uh, what's her name, who was kind of pop, Michelle Bachman. I mean, I can go back through Republicans and Democrats in the last 15, 20 years, women candidates that, you know, they're just, you know, they, they're just not presidential material. Now, when, when a woman comes along that is serious presidential material, she'll have as good a shot as anybody. It's not misogyny. It's just that they don't have the right stuff. When the right one comes along, it'll happen. Okay, we have Michelle Dean. She's going to go with uh, Brian, who wants to be a millionaire, Williams. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking um, that's a good one, Michelle. I was also, also thinking... Uh, of uh, the uh, the Monty Hall guy, let's make a deal, Brian. Let's make a deal, Williams. <laughs> um, definitely can't count the money. That's for sure. Can't count the numbers. Can't do math. It's a shame. Uh, let's see. And she also is going to go along with the Rotten Reverend Clinton and the toilet paper hoarders who are fighting in stores over toilet paper. Yeah, that's true. I saw that on a news site somewhere. People fighting over toilet fist fights over toilet paper. So. I don't know. Maybe it's getting pretty bad. I don't live in a city that's infected with the virus yet, so I imagine it'll get here, but for now it hasn't, and uh, so I haven't seen that, but I imagine, you know, people freak out. Uh, they do, and, uh, you know, you're going to have those things, I assume. Um, Gordon is going to go with Schumer, Biden, and Williams. Three solid picks there. Dennis Shaw will go with Cuck, uh, Chuck the Cuck. Freddie Schaffer will go with Chucky, Mike Pence, in the mainstream media uh, for their fear porn. Uh, 
Sue Sung. We'll go with Schumer, Warren, and Graham. Jamie and and Zavino. We'll go with Schumer, Brian Williams, and Jerry Nadler, the Penguin. None of your business. We'll go with any politician wearing a purple tie. I agree. <laughs> I don't like that purple tie thing. I think that's the color of the resistance. Linda Martin. We'll go with uh, Schumer, Williams, and Biden. Uh, let's see, Joe Booty. Those who can't see that the rotten Reverend Clinton is jumping into the race. Yep, that's the second person to uh, chime in on that. Uh, again, I think it's obvious. I mean, I think, to me, this is really, really obvious. I can understand why people didn't see this coming a year or two or three ago, even though I said the day after 2016 that she would be the nominee in 2020 again, come hell or high water. Uh, but now that you see that you have... Kami Bernie, who they're not going to allow to be the nominee. You have quid pro quo Joe, who's mentally not up to the job. There really is no other choice right now other than the rotten reverend. Pretty obvious to me. Dennis Waddell is going to go with Brian Wims and the staff over there at MSNBC. Yeah, a lot of people missed that, and it should have been really something really easy. Just a lot of people missed it. Maybe none of them can do math over there at MSNBC. One day closer to death. Uh, not very happy with Trump, Mike Pence, and the CDC regarding the coronavirus. I guess you could certainly make an argument for that. I don't know. Maybe uh, they could have done more. Maybe they haven't done enough. I don't know. Hard to say. I'm not in that position. Um, so I don't really know how much more to comment. I think I'm just like everyone else, I guess. I'm, I don't like what I see happening in the markets. It's uh, definitely going to affect the global economy. could cause a slowdown. Uh, fortunately, our economy is pretty strong right now, but something like this could certainly throw a wrench in the spokes. Not what you want to see seven, eight months out of an election. I just hope that this thing uh, doesn't get uh, too bad. I hope that the warmer weather and all, that uh, hopefully it dissipates and they come up with a vaccine and it's ready to go for the fall when this thing could likely make a return. But I'm just hoping that this thing... Uh, uh, calms down and doesn't get any worse. I think it might get a little worse, but hopefully it won't become a major, major epidemic. But everybody's watching, and I guess there's some criticism that can go around. These types of things are kind of hard to get a handle on, especially if you're the president. It's very tricky. You don't want to send the wrong signals and cause panic, cause panic in the markets. Uh, and then if it does, it turns out not to be much of a big deal, then you've created undue problems. Uh, if you don't jump out and, and, and get ahead of it and it does turn out uh, to be something really bad, then you look like you bobbled it. So I don't know. It's a, t it's a tough one right now, but uh, I'm going to put my, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with the president on this one. I think he's making the best call he can make uh, based on the information that he has. And uh, so uh, I'm not going to criticize him on this, but I understand where the people out there uh, do have some criticism, and that's certainly uh, your prerogative to uh, to make your opinion known. Uh, let's see, we have Philly James is going to go with uh, liberal math. <laughs> yeah, the liberal math practiced by uh, Brian Williams, um, along with Biden and Bernie. And of course, Larry Lyons, I'm not sure if he was suggesting that he wanted to pick uh, quid pro quo Joe for his pick of the week, but I'll assume that's what he was suggesting uh, because he just gave us a little bit of a, uh, a ditty uh, using Joe O. Dementia to the tune of the Simon and Garfunkel tune, uh, the Mrs. Robinson song. <laughs> Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? That sort of thing. Yes, Joe O. Dema o. Dementia. Joe O. Dementia. Where have you gone, Joe O. Dementia? <laughs> that's a good. That's a good. That's a good one, Larry. Where have you gone, Joe O. Dementia? I don't know. He's out to lunch, brother. Out, out in the pasture. Doesn't know where he is. The winner of this week's dumbass of the week is Brian Williams. Brian Williams is our winner of Dumbass of the Week. Coming in just four points behind, we have Chuck the Cuck Schumer. And coming in just one point behind him in third place, a solid third place finish for quid pro quo Joe. Barisma Joe Biden. So there you go. Brian Williams first, Cuck, uh, Chuck the Cuck second, and quid pro quo Joe third. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be back tomorrow with more Towergate. See you guys. Bye.